So, ladies and gentlemen, again, please take your seats and let's start this session four, in fact. So, this session is about the current and future challenges facing ombudsman. And, in fact, the topics of this session, which are very varied, but linked to all the work that you do, and they were chosen in the light of the feedback that we received uh, after the network survey uh, that the European Ombudsman Office conducted after last year's ENO conference. You may remember that. Um, so let me just very briefly uh, introduce the, uh, the panelists who are going to help us to navigate through these different challenges. Andreas Botakis is the Greek Ombudsman. Uh, Andreas. Uh, Ule Madisa is the Estonian Chancellor of Justice. Uh, Laura Vidovic is a Croatian Ombudswoman, and Paul Marsen is Director for Civil Society Engagement at the Open Government uh, Partnership that we talked so much about this morning, but also yesterday. Uh, all, all three of these uh, wonderful people will be directing the open workshops on the different topics that um, they are going to be discussing now. Paul Masson will be replaced by his colleague Tonsu Basu, who will be doing the workshop on open government later on. But uh, I'm going to kick off with you, Emily, uh, because um, one of the things that you did earlier this year was quite groundbreaking, in fact, and I was privileged to be part of it, it was an award for good administration. I think it was the first time ever that that had been done uh, in the EU context. And as we talk about best practice uh, in, in, the, in the realm of what ombudsmen do, I was wondering if you could just you know, tell us a little bit about that. And you'll be interested to see that, in fact, there will be slides and pictures from this absolutely wonderful conference that was held uh, earlier this year. Tell us a bit, Emily. Thank you, Shada. Well, this was uh, an idea we, we came up with um, last, last year, and I suppose it came out of a, a number of impulses. First of all, it was something that I had never um, been brave enough to do when I was Irish Ombudsman to give an award for good administration because there is a risk for the organization in that you give an award to somebody and the next day they're involved in a scandal and <laughs> um, you look rather stupid. Um, but however, I thought the, the European context was slightly different. Um, um, I, I suppose as European Ombudsman, when, you're, uh, when there's a lot of your skepticism around and when the, the EU is in a slightly fragile state, uh, sometimes, as I think I said yesterday at another intervention, one can be accused of feeding that your skepticism. It's something um, I never uh, accept because um, by its nature, the European an Ombudsman is going to be critical of institutions, but only in... In a, in a positive way in order to um, uh, make them uh, into institutions that are doing what they should do and uh, be properly accountable and transparent uh, to the people. Um, I suppose I was also struck by the fact that in um, European, there are many European uh, institutions, agencies and bodies, and, and many of them, we were aware, do excellent work. And I wasn't sure that this work was shared even amongst the institutions themselves. So this is the idea around sharing best practice. And I suppose I was also struck by the fact that their civil servants are they get a hard time in many countries, including my own, possibly in yours as well, but also particularly, I think, in the EU context when typically the faceless Brussels bureaucrat is, is seen as a, almost a hate figure in, in, in some media. And it wasn't that I saw my role as doing a public relations job for, for the EU, but I thought it was important for, um, for good administrative purposes and others to try and highlight the good work that is done. So with that, we launched um, uh, an awards uh, scheme. We didn't know whether we would get 10 entries, 20, 30. Uh, my colleagues kept my expectations low. They insisted we wouldn't get more than 30. Uh, in the end, we got 90 um, applications from, from all across uh, Europe. And I was helped uh, by an advisory team, which included uh, Peter Tindall, uh, in, his, in his IOI uh, capacity, and they really did the hard work because they had to, through, uh, they had to sift through um, all, of the, all of the entries and uh, then uh, present um, you know, their, their recommendations to me, um, most of which uh, I, I would have accepted, and, and, and there, were, there were some which, which I saw benefits in, and, and eventually we, we, uh, we, we did a, a shortlist. And then we had an event 
And any of you who have been to events in, in, in Brussels, apart from this one, which of course is just wonderful and warm and all of collegial and all of that, will know that there's a, a certain formality uh, uh, among uh, events uh, in, in Brussels. They can be a little, bit, a little bit stiff, but I have to say this event was amazing because for virtually everybody there, it was the first time that their work had been recognized in any capacity. And literally, there were grown men with tears in their eyes when they were given awards for the work that they had done. It was, it was quite extraordinary. Um, and I, I remember there was one, one man who, who was part of a team that won an award, and he said that he had been a public servant for 35 years, and this was the first time that his work had been acknowledged. And even to do that was something that was very special. Uh, there were winners in different categories. Everybody, everybody's work was on screen. There was a short list, and then there was the, the winner that was announced. And we had many categories, just general public service, communications, innovation, collaboration, all of that. And the one, the, the overall winner, I think I chose because to me, it wasn't just about good administration, but it was also about showing the power of collaboration. And this was uh, a project uh, that, was, that came from um, the H Health Commission, uh, DG Sante, and it was work that they had done with 24 member states in the area of rare diseases. Um, diseases that, that maybe just a handful of people in any of our member states might suffer from. And therefore, unless you get collaboration in research, you know, you're not going to get uh, improvements made. So the award went to uh, DG Sante for what they had, the, the collaborative work in relation to setting up reference networks in 24 member states, which will um, hopefully uh, greatly alleviate the suffering of people with uh, rare diseases and may even in some cases lead to cures. Another one was given for, it was the, the LIFE project, which was the environmental DG, which was work that was done in Poland uh, in association with the local authorities in a place called Malopolska in Poland, which was experiencing very high levels of environmental pollution. And the work they had done collaborat collaboratively uh, with the Polish authorities uh, meant that already the pollution levels are declining. So again, this, this was great work from the EU institutions working, working with, uh, with the member states. So it was a very, um, it was a very uh, a positive initiative. And I remember also when at the event, listening to, and afterwards when we had lunch together, listening to some of the, uh, the, the officials saying, I didn't know that we did that. I didn't know that this was happening. Um, and I, it, it, it struck me that if people in the institutions aren't fully aware of some of the great work that is being done, then how can the citizens be? And again, this feeds into this uh, particular narrative about, the, uh, about Europe, which is not to say at all that everything in Europe is brilliant. It isn't, and there isn't good administration everywhere, but there are very high standards. And I think also in some of the projects we can see some of the very valuable work, which has such a direct uh, impact on the citizens. So thank you, Shannon. Thank you, Emelina. That's your microphone. Um, thank you very much. No, it was really uh, uh, totally emotional, uh, very exhilarating. And there was a great deal of uh, excitement in the air. I have to say it was quite a new experience for me as well. I write and talk a lot about what goes wrong, but this was an exceptional moment where we were talking about what does work in very, very important ways. So let's start the panel discussion. And this is sort of like a, a, a curtain raiser for your working uh, workshops later on. Start with you, Andreas. Um, with Laura already talked about the problems with refugees, etc. But uh, from your point of view, Andreas, what are the main sort of challenges you face uh, as regards refugees? I mean, Greece has received so many um, in the last two or three years. What are your challenges? Yeah. Um, yes, we have had uh, the unfortunate privilege of being at the spotlight um, uh, for a number of reasons. Um, I, in fact, Greece has been uh, going through several, well, two very important crises. One being the sort of uh, fiscal crisis that it has been um, taking place in Greece. We are now in the eighth year of successive uh, recession. Um, and uh, on top of that, we had the, what we understand as humanitarian sort of crisis uh, that um, uh, was really aggravated in uh, 2015 mm -hmm. when we had the uh, eruption of uh, population flows, uh, especially coming from uh, Eastern Aegean and uh, landing, entering Greece uh, on the Greek islands, the Greek islands of the Northeast Aegean. 
Um, it's very difficult to, to choose and to select um, some of the problems that we have been facing. I will try to limit myself to the most basic ones, the most fundamental ones, and the ones that, as the Greek Ombudsman and our office has had to deal with. I think that I could um, categorize them under three broad groups. One that has to do with capacity, one that uh, has to do with cooperation, and the other one with the uh, existing legal framework on capacity. Um, I'm sure that Laura also will be talking about this because I understand this is the topic for uh, that she will be debating. I wish I also were taking part in it because I have to tell you, for instance, that uh, in our office we have not been able to hire new personnel for roughly 10 years now. Um, we have not, uh, we have had to operate uh, with a budget that has been cut to roughly one third of what it used to be 10 years ago. Uh, and at the same time, we have had to operate under and to, to re react and to be present uh, as uh, the monitoring uh, mechanism, the monitoring authority, uh, and to assume new responsibilities, new competences and mandates. For instance, we are the national monitor, human rights monitoring mechanism, external one, uh, for the directive 2008-115, which has to do with uh, forced returns and readmissions in the frame of the uh, joint statement, uh, the EU-Turkey joint statement. This means practically that my staff has to be <clears throat> almost constantly on the islands, not only inspecting and investigating, but obviously also accompanying uh, people, third country nationals who are being returned either to their place of origin or of course, to uh, readmit it to Turkey. Um, to give you an indication, we have two to three uh, operations, Frontex run operations, on a weekly basis at the moment, uh, mostly from the island of Lesbos. Um, so, another point uh, that has to do with uh, the limited capacity of my office uh, is that we are also the NPM of Greece, the National Preventive Mechanism in the frame of the OPCAT the optional protocol of the United Nations against torture. Uh, this also obviously is a very big challenge and a privilege in the sense that we have the right and the duty and the responsibility to investigate, inspect all the detention centers, hotspots, uh, facilities, etc. But obviously uh, we feel that uh, we could have done a better job mm. if we had more uh, staff and more resources. Turning to the cooperation aspect of our problems, this has to do also with the fact that the way that the Greek administration, but also the EU administration, has reflected on the general situation. We feel, I feel, that we have had, um, uh, that there has been a lack of coordination, there has been an absence of uh, an authority coordinating all parties involved in the handling of the crisis. Um, just to give you an indication, we have at the moment in Greece uh, a specific Ministry on Migration Policy, but it doesn't have an administration supporting it, so mm -hmm. it's, a min it's a ministry that is uh, primarily um, centered around the Minister's office. It doesn't have any organigram, it doesn't have any yeah. administration, um, so it is quite difficult for it to, to act and to, to perform as it should be. Another example is that we have had uh, four, if I count correctly, uh, different secretaries generals in this ministry because all of them have resigned. Um, so there is a lack of cooperation. There is a, 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 an important uh, missing element there. Um, again, uh, in the way that we are performing our uh, mandate, we have had problems uh, with uh, authorities and services I'm referring in particular to our mandate relating to the forced returns. Uh, we understand this mandate uh, as uh, quite uh, important and wide in the sense that we want to inspect and investigate not only uh, during the operation for return, but also in the so-called pre-departure stage. We want to make sure that the people who are being returned or readmitted to Turkey are 
the ones whose uh, asylum applications have been properly processed mm -hmm. and obviously uh, the, um, their uh, sort of requests have been refused, but legally. And uh, in many instances that was not uh, easy to achieve because we were not informed of return operations in good time uh, by the Greek police and by Frontex. And now uh, the last point that I want to make and relates to the problems that we are facing as the Greek Ombudsman's Office has to do with the general framework um, in Greece. Um, it is already a, more than a year since the joint statement with uh, Turkey, but the Greek administration is still operating under uh, a state of emergency. Uh, this has very important connotations in the sense that uh, the Greek administration uh, and the Greek government uh, is um, operating, is using instruments and uh, mechanisms that are not the uh, normal instruments provided by the legal framework, the existing legislative framework. They can do that because they claim a state of emergency. Mm -hmm. um, our belief is that uh, we are no longer facing the incredible flows of 2015, where roughly a million people crossed Greece and entered uh, Central, Europe, Central Europe through the so-called Western Balkan corridor. At the moment, uh, if one uh, is um, um, uh, relies on the official uh, sort of um, um, data and uh, statistics, we have uh, roughly 60,000 people residing in Greece. Uh, I don't think that this, mm, this number um, justifies uh, having a state of emergency in Greece. Um, Having a state of emergency is also very uh, detrimental to preserving, uh, in general, the notion of rule of law, transparency. Um, obviously, uh, under a state of emergency, uh, the government and the administration may uh, use, de deviate from the normal uh, procedures, may, for instance, when it has to do with public procurement tenders. Mm -hmm. And so we are very concerned about this, and we hope that very soon this will, be, uh, this will come to an end. And, and things will uh, somehow turn, uh, change and become more normal. Mm. Well, this Thank you. With. Yes, this to start with. Thank you very much. So budget cuts, no new staff, uh, but new responsibilities, a ministry without people, basically, and, and a state of emergency that allows all kinds of violations of rule of law. I mean, it is a pretty grim picture that you're painting, Andreas, and I, I will have questions for you later on. I'm sure also from other participants. But let's move on to Ula now and the question of digital administration. You know, uh, Ula, we hear a lot about this, e-government, e-administration, et cetera, but I have to confess, I myself am a bit puzzled about what it actually means. So perhaps you can start off by giving us some examples of uh, e-administration. Uh, thank you. I hope it works. And I'd like to start with the Thanks uh, to Emily O'Reilly and her staff for organizing this event and for including the issue of uh, digital administration Just hold into it the closer. agenda. Um, some colleagues, ombudspersons, and some politicians in Estonia have asked me, what has an ombudsman? In Estonia, uh, Chancellor of Justice has two tasks, ombudsman and constitutional review. So they ask me, what do you have to do with digital administration? But many of our colleagues have noticed that's the part of the everyday work for all of us. I've learned that many colleagues have, like me, uh, treated cases of digital gap, discrimination of them who are not able or not wanting to use internet for e-services against others who want transparency, protection of privacy, etc. So it's the part of everyday work for all of us. And like good colleague from Greece has mentioned that the new challenges um, make us to hire some new people, although there is no budget for that. I believe that um, the issue of e-governance of e-services, public e-services requires the same. 
that we will need in our offices people who know what's inside the black box, who can audit, access the databases, the technical issues to understand what is said about it. They can check whether the safety is there, whether the internal control systems, external control systems, including us, are working properly. So it's really a big challenge. And I'm quite sure that we are going to elaborate further in today's working group. And already here, I'd like to say that we are organizing a conference, especially uh, of issues of e-governance in Tallinn, Estonia in January. And you all are warmly welcome there. And I thank all who have accepted our invitation to come and to share the experience because it will be, um, first of all, case studies. Now, what is good digital administration? Of course, it's a very simple acquisition. It's good administration plus advantages given or enabled by digitalization. I mean, a good digital administration fulfills all principles of good governance and in the same time, the public e-services should be um, better accessible easier, quicker, and even more transparent and reliable. I believe that in almost all countries, people know what is e-tax board. People are used to declare their taxes mm -hmm. online, and it's more and more popular e-service everywhere. E-health, what we have in Estonia, is rather uncommon. And there is a huge interest towards it, and I will um, go into the detail a little bit later. And we have online voting for 12 years already, countrywide, with binding results in all elections. And what I have seen and what have these scholars found, people who once use the e-services want to use them, want to remain to use them. But there is one very, very important thing we must accept. In today's world, the more digitalized you are, the more vulnerable you are, unfortunately. So um, that's our task and the government's task always to to check that the systems are safe, they are protected, protected against uh, technical attacks and that um, misuse of data and misuse of digital administration is avoided. Again, our task. Uh, now, there are some preconditions for good digital administration and I'd like to list them. Uh, first of all, and that's something what we uh, would need, in my opinion, in all Europe, that's the reliable identification tool. What would be uh, usable for all public and many private services. And European Union, it could be something what makes the administration much better on the European level, on the country level, and also on the community level. Uh, for example, in Estonia, we have a compulsory electronic identity, electronic identity card. All inhabitants must have it, citizens, all other residents. And you don't have any choice. It's the first compulsory identification document, and it enables safe, reliable online identification and digital signature. It's up to you whether you use it, but it's given to everyone. And we have seen that everyone who starts to use remains to use. And that's something what we would need in all Europe. Let's see. And that's, in our case, it's a very good example of uh, good digital administration. Uh, nowadays, it's possible to take a selfie 
what I did as my last identity card expired. I just took a selfie. Then I made a photograph of my old-fashioned signature on the paper, filled an application online, signed it digitally, and sent my selfie photograph and the photograph of my signature per mail to the police office. So I had to go there only once. Once to wait in a queue, and it was a real advantage. And really they checked my face and the photograph and they even mentioned a lovely thing, namely uh, that the five-year-old photograph taken in the office was much more similar to me than this selfie. <laughs> and I was a little unhappy and I don't know whether I should now apply a new one without selfie and go there twice to have a normal picture. But anyway, it was very convenient. And I, in my experience, there are no complaints that the picture is awful. People want to have quickly and conveniently and without queue the documents or name their baby or what, whatever. Uh, the second precondition for good digital administration is uh, security and of the information system and databases. Uh, if we want to share sensible data, we must guarantee security, it's clear. And the third uh, precondition is um, control, internal and external control mechanisms, including ombudsman and the people of themselves. In my opinion, and that's something we are fighting for in Estonia, is that everyone must have access to the data collected about them in any government agencies. We have such condition in the Constitution. Of course, as the Constitution was drafted uh, 25 years ago, no one thought about e-government. But nowadays it means that if you identify yourself with this ID card, you must have access to the data which are collected and saved and stored, for example, in e-health system. You must see the logs which doctors have seen your data? Has someone sent your X-ray somewhere? And after that, you can ask, why? Please, explain, why? Because we must prevent the situation where these data are misused, very sensible data. And afterwards, I will um, um, describe one quite dangerous case with the same e-health. And now to conclude my first intervention. Um, yes, there are risks. And as I said that today's word, um, digital services mean that you are very vulnerable. You, it's a person, it's the government, does it mean that we should turn back to the paper-based administration? No, it's not possible. Simply, the cuts in public sector are reality. And this reality will remain. And second, the public demand. People are used to use these very convenient services and that's our task to guarantee the safety and it's quite sure that today's lifestyle demands these new e-services so thanks Thank you. Thank you very much, Willis. So really the brave new world of technology with its uh, weaknesses, but also big success and the ease of uh, actually even voting. I mean, I think this is something that we really need to follow up uh, across Europe. Um, it's one of my big ambitions is to get that, uh, secure that. Thank you very much indeed. And I'm, as you said, there will be questions and follow ups, but I want to move on to Laura now. So, Laura, we already heard from, um, from Andreas about 
cuts, budgetary cuts, etc. And so I, I, I guess the question is, uh, how do public administrations maintain good standards at a time of reduced resources, budgetary resources? Yes, thank you. And of course, I will join all the colleagues who have thanked um, Emily and her office for having this wonderful conference and inviting us all. I think it's very important for all of us to meet uh, here and to discuss things and, you know, support one another. Uh, so I'm sure we'll all leave home with new energy and new ideas. Um, when it comes to reduced resources, um, I think the, the issue is actually twofold. One is how does administration maintain uh, uh, good standards, but also how it affects our offices. Um, when it comes to maintaining good standards, I'm sure I won't discover in your continent when I say uh, it's very difficult and the, the economic crisis and the austerity has impacted the enjoyment of human rights in the last seven, eight, nine, even ten years in, in many countries. And not just in economic, social and cultural rights, but also civil and political. So it doesn't only come to the social welfare, um, labor market, unemployment, access to health, it comes to free legal aid. It comes to access to courts to those that are most impoverished. And we have many examples in, in Croatia where that's the case and that we report on uh, regularly. Um, the thing is, and I'm sure it's the reality in, in all of our countries, when governments are faced with tough choices, they prioritize. And I just don't buy the argument that there is no money, because there is money. I think all of our countries have money. It's just a question on how they prioritize their resources. And very often, of course, it's not in the way that we, as ombudsmen and human rights institutions, would prioritize. Um, and yes, we do need to remind them very often of, on, on our opinion on that. Um, and also the fact is that, that with the cuts, those that are most affected are the most vulnerable anyway. The, the impoverished victims of violence, children, elderly, people with disabilities, prisoners. Um, we do receive many complaints from, from the vulnerable, even though, of course, this is not, there is only so much you can see from the complaint. Um, but one of the most often would be regarding the availability or rather unavailability of the public transport in rural areas, uh, particularly uh, when the school ends, so during the summer. When there's a school, then of course the local authorities would provide for the subsidized uh, buses or train tickets. Uh, but when there's off school time, when there's summer, that stops and the people that live in those areas, particularly elderly, have very difficult time because there's no public transportation to get groceries, to go to the post office, to have even basic urgent health care, not just um, regular, regular doctor appointment. Uh, so the poverty combined with physical isolation actually contributes to the social exclusion, which is then uh, very detrimental to many. And in cases like this, our experience is that it's not sufficient just to send a recommendation upon an investigation to the local authority by regular snail mail <laughs> or an email. It's very important to go there. It's important to talk to all of them. Um, and our experience is when we do talk to local authorities, they see that we care. They approach it differently. They do take our, own, our recommendations on board more often. One example is uh, city of Zadar. I'm sure many of you have already been there. If, if not, then you've heard of it. it. Within its administrative jurisdiction, it has 12 small islands, which are inhabited by about 100 or 200, or maybe, well, not more than 200 people during the winter time. In summer, of course, it's 20, it's 50 fold. But in the winter, they're on their own and most of those inhabitants are actually elderly. So we talked to the mayor of Zadar, um, and he actually included in the budget for this year, so it starts with this year, that on each island there is a person paid by city of Zadar who is on the salary 
either part-time or full-time, depending on the needs, who takes care about the elderly in that island, on the whole island, in their basic needs, such as bringing their simple meals or getting the grocery or simple cleaning, things like that. So it is possible to influence. It has to be timely and we have to be in direct contact so that we are listened to. Um, this is also the opportunity, and I see it like that in, in the work of my office, to fight against mistrust. It was mentioned yesterday how uh, people mistrust institutions in general. They also don't trust us. Many of them see us as just another institution who's useless and worthless anyway. So when they see us on the ground, when they see us actually talk to people, we, we can fight against that mistrust and show that, that we really actually care. Another buzzword I think that was mentioned many times today and yesterday is the participation and the empowerment of people. Because only if they know their rights, they can exercise them. They can demand those rights to be represented. If we want the, the ferry lines to respond to people's needs, we need to have those people, those inhabitants of islands, at that table when the ferry lines are discussed, including the price, because they very well know what's fair and what's not, and who should be uh, granted a subsidized ticket for, for a ferry and who shouldn't. And it, it is important then for us to advocate with the local authorities and the provider of a service, even though it's a private company, that it has to include those people that are affected by the decision to be at the table to discuss it, um, and in a manner which is not discriminatory. Um, accountability, of course, it's also an opportunity to, to ask for the accountability of the uh, government at all levels when it comes to prioritizing um, resources and, and funds that would be allocated for, for um, a certain services that, that we think are important. So I think, once again, we need to find all the creative ways that go beyond the complaints receiving and responding and handling uh, into strongly advocating actually uh, for the uh, local and central governments in, in how they use funds so that the, the enjoyment of your, all human rights is, is guaranteed. Mm. So it's uh, interesting, Laura. So, of course, uh, the cuts are having a big impact and forcing governments to prioritize, and often the cuts hit the vulnerable, but offices like yours are finding creative ways to actually make that work in terms of outreach, building trust, etc. So uh, thank you very much. Uh, as, again, you know, there will be follow-up questions, but thank you for that opening. So to Paul Masson then, I mean, one of the things we've talked about a lot, as you know from the beginning, is uh, open governance, open government as well. Um, in Europe, we've discussed this a little bit this morning, but in Europe, how would you describe the state of open, open governance? Are we getting there? Is it a very new concept that uh, needs more time to develop and evolve? Thanks. I mean, there, there's different ways to look at it, right? If you, if you take membership of OGP is one indicator. You could say, you know, we, we, we should sit down and, and be happy. 21 out of 28 countries are a member. Oh, yeah. Most accession countries are a member. Most neighborhood countries are members. Um, if you look at some of the global indices, whether it's the Open Budget Survey or the Transparency International Corruption Perception Index or um, the Open Data Barometer, you could also say, you know, lean back and relax. Um, but that obviously is not the case. Um, what we heard yesterday is that, um, that that is a positive sign, but that doesn't mean we've solved the underlying problems of, of uh, citizen distrust, of disenchantment in government, of shrinking civic space, of uh, rising authoritarianism and, and corruption. Um, so the overall picture, I think, is you know, the basis is right, but the picture overall is not right yet. And let, let, me, give me, let me give two examples where, where I think that, that inspire me. 
um, but it also shows we need to do more. One is, is from Italy. One of the commitments Italy made in OGP, and I think Sanjay touched on, upon it yesterday, but I want to elaborate a little bit, is the government decided to release the data of all European cohesion funds, which in the case of Italy is 100 billion euro. <laughs> that's, that's a lot of money. And it's one million projects, and they made it available in an extremely user-friendly way. You know, it ranged from individual student loans to highway bridges. So it's really uh, exceptional that they released that data. Step one, transparency. But that in itself doesn't give you anything. I mm. mean, in the short term, it might actually feed distrust, as we've seen with some of the, um, the scandals in the European, or in the, in the British Parliament, for example, when some of the, you know, the, um, the access UK and what they were paid for it. Um, so transparency in itself won't do it. But what's interesting what they did in Italy is that they actually started working and training citizens, journalists, civil society organizations, academics to be civic monitors at a scale that a formal audit institute could never do. They, because the scale, the number of people that you can mobilize to be citizen auditors is at a scale that, that you with your strapped resources can never mobilize. But the most interesting thing, I think, what it led to is dialogue. It were students going into the community saying, well, I see in the database that there was funding for a youth center, but I don't see a youth center. Um, and start the conversation with the authorities, which is not, obviously, not an easy conversation to have, but it's an important conversation to have. Um, in some cases, they managed to unblock what was blocking um, the flow of funds. In other cases, not. Obviously, it's not that easy. But it's a good example. Another example comes from the Netherlands, um, where one of the experimental commitments they included in their OGP action plan um, was, and it goes a bit against the, the idea of digitalization of government, where civil servants actually picked up the phone and called the filers of FOI requests uh -huh. and basically had a discussion about what information are you out for? Having a discussion about, okay, this is the information I have and I can actually provide you this and it's more difficult because, you know, this and this and this. That conversation had advantages for the government. I mean, it, it led to less you know, complaints and appeals. Um, it led to shorter lead times, less costs. But most importantly in that example for me is that the filer, whether they got the information or not, um, were more positive afterwards about their experience of dealing with the government. And that's a really important thing to, to capture. That, that, that dialogue, that conversation between government and citizens, that demystifying what government is, that in the terms of, uh, in the words of, of First Vice President Timmermans yesterday, treat people as citizens rather than customers. Um, um, that's, that's an important basis. So in that sense, I think the basis is there, um, but the scale is not. Mm -hmm. This is still very much, you know, an, an disjointed set of inspiring examples of civil servants doing really their best in making things different, as Emily was pointing out in her introductory remarks. Um, but it's not a culture yet. It's not a culture of doing it the open government way. It's not a culture of inclusion and open conversations. And there are three things we see, um, well, let me pick out two. Two we see that, that block this from going to scale. One is, there's a lot of rhetoric about bringing back the citizen to the heart of government and politicians feeling um, challenged by the lack of distrust. Um, but if you look at the action to actually solve it, the action doesn't match the words. Mm. Um, and sometimes it's that they don't know how to do it. It is extremely difficult to do it. We see that in, in OGP every day that it is difficult to bring citizens back into government, to have open and honest dialogues. It's very difficult to do and it's, you know, if you do it for the first time, you're, you're bound to make mistakes. Um, to do it in a meaningful way is really difficult. So that's one. The second one we see is, and that's especially in Europe, is some complacency in OGP. OGP very deliberately was um, positioned as not being a development platform mm -hmm. with the idea that even though every country has a different context and a different starting point, there is a need and an opportunity to be ambitious and reform public administrations. How you do it, what you focus on will be different, but that opportunity and that need is there. But if you speak to a lot of 
politicians and civil servants across Europe, there is a bit of complacency linked to these good scores on these international indices that says, well, we're doing actually pretty well. We're not the ones that you should be talking to. You should go to Africa because there they really have a problem if it comes to open government. Um, and that's not true. I mean, the underlying problems might be different in Africa than in Europe, uh, and the solutions will definitely look different. Mm. Um, but the underlying principles and approaches of open government, if it comes to transparency combined with citizen participation, accountability, and perhaps most important, government responsiveness, um, will be the same. Right. So uh, not yet a culture, but almost getting there needs to be scaled up and obviously a sense of complacency, which we see sometimes in Europe on, on some important issues, I have to say. Thank you very much. Before I take a, give you a second round of questions, ask you a second round of questions, I do want to get some feedback from, uh, from participants here. So if you have any specific questions, I know there's a workshop later on on most of these issues and you'll have the granular details there, but if you want to come in at this, at this point, please don't hesitate. So I'm going to give a quick look around. Nobody wants to come in specifically. Okay, so then let me, let me take it, all right? Yes, please, uh, go, Gora, yeah. Ja, äh, Gero Storja, Han, Petitionsausschuss Deutschland. Oh. Ich habe eine Frage an die Kollegin aus Kroatien. Das, was Sie eindrucksvoll geschildert haben als Ihre Aufgabe, auch als Ihre zukünftige Aufgabe, das sehe ich eigentlich als ursprüngliche Aufgabe für frei gewählte Abgeordnete. Das heißt, da, wo die Verwaltung nicht funktioniert, da kümmert sich der Abgeordnete drum, dass sie funktioniert. Und ich glaube, Sie wären total überfordert, wenn Sie für ganz Kroatien die Busverbindung überprüfen wollen und die Fährpreise. Ähm, haben Sie nicht die Hoffnung, dass die Abgeordneten zukünftig in Kroatien diese Aufgabe übernehmen können? Thank you. Sorry. Thank you, Thank you for that question. Does anyone else want to come in uh, this point? Okay. Um, so let's let's do the second round, and then uh, you can uh, take Gero's question as well. So, Andreas, just to come back to you. So, the, for refugees, um, you indicated how you know tough it is and how grim the landscape is. Uh, you know, housing, schooling, um, also you know, just informing refugees. issues well um, very recently we actually published a report the Greek Ombudsman's office published a report that um, uh, somehow uh, we tried to present our findings um, over a period of uh, roughly three years uh, we tried in this way to um, analyze and to assess the way that uh, the Greek administration has reflected on the whole situation in three different phases, because there were three different phases. That's how we recognize it. That's how we see it. The one prior to the actual explosion of uh, flows, the period during the, the flow, uh, the population flow that um, uh, was totally unmanageable, and the present period where actually the numbers are, as I said, uh, stable and uh, to our understanding manageable. Um, obviously, if one um, reviews our report, um, one realizes that there have been different uh, reflections, different reactions, sometimes more effective and sometimes less so, in uh, those different phases of the whole situation as it was evolving in Greece. Um, what we feel, what I, as the Greek Ombudsman's office, uh, we, we feel and we think that we should be focusing on, and we have tried to convince both the Greek administration, but to the extent that we can also the European agencies that are involved in the whole management of the situation, is that we have to, to change the narrative, that we have to change the sort of the, the focus of our attention. We should have done it already uh, some time ago. We should now be focusing on schemes and programs uh, of inclusion of integrating the people that are going to 
stay in Europe, in Greece, or in other countries of Europe. We haven't done much in this respect. That's our feeling. For instance, we feel that uh, housing and offering uh, services, education services, health services, and so on, are not entirely technical or managerial issues and problems that have to be solved, but they are primarily and predominantly political issues. Um, we also, I believe that, um, and if I may turn also uh, my focus a bit to the European Union and uh, the EU institutions on this point, um, there is, um, it seems to, to, to me, there is um, uh, an emphasis that is being placed lately by the relevant EU institutions and their representatives on uh, enhancing uh, an atmosphere of deterrence uh, not um, simply an atmosphere, but also on finding the necessary tools, mechanisms, and um, uh, so as to create uh, an atmosphere of deterrence, not only for those who are actually already residing within Europe, but also for those who might be considering entering Europe. And to, to, to me, to the Greek Ombudsman, this is very uh, troubling, this is very problematic. We are trying to highlight it to, in any way possible, and we try to confront it in any way possible. And in this respect, we feel that although many things obviously have been done in the course of these three years, um, and the situation is obviously much, has improved, in fact, we, we still feel that, we're, we, we, that no one can be satisfied when we still have um, fenced accommodation facilities in Greece uh, or in other countries as well. Um, we are very worried by the risk of what we call ghettoization or segregation or the um, um, familiarization of our communities, of our society with uh, designated spaces for third country nationals. Uh, we, f we find it, uh, we think that this is a very frightening prospect and that our national administration, and I'm sure many other national administrations, administrations around Europe, have not really contemplated mm -hmm. the consequences of maintaining such uh, facilities in the short, medium, and long run. Uh, the problems that will be coming out of maintaining such, situation, such a situation will be, uh, well, if not unmanageable, very difficult to handle in the, foreseeable, in the next few years. So we are trying to, to, to shift the focus of the discussion, of the discourse, into actual positive uh, uh, policies, poly positive uh, initiatives, um, with a view to normalizing the life of the people who are living either in Greece or obviously in other countries in Europe. Um, and uh, we feel that this should be the focus for um, all of uh, the Ombudsman mm -hmm. in Europe. Um, and we, I think that if we all try to, to convince our national administrations that this should be the course of action uh, from now on, at least from now on, although I repeat, uh, a lot of time has been lost, um, something better can come out of it, or at least we may min be able to minimize the consequences of what has already happened and we will witness in the uh, next few years. Mm. And in doing so, I think uh, Andreas also recuperate our lost credibility as Europe in dealing with the so-called crisis, because we recently had a discussion with the Prince of Jordan, and you know, when you realize how massive the refugee population is in countries in the region, uh, and perhaps we you know, compare our reaction to it, it does create a certain sense of, may I use the word, shame. Yes, and if I may um, make a point on, uh, on what you are saying, um, First of all, I think that it is um, a phenomenal coincidence, I'm sure it's not a coincidence, that one of the um, um, sort of discussions that we're having during this panel has to do with the migration and refugee situation, because today is the World Refugee uh, Day. Right, right. So, um, much like yesterday, we were discussing, debating about Brexit, Brexit. and it was the, the launching of the Brexit negotiations. Yes. <laughs> you are, yes, you are. Uh, uh, I think that so uh, a lot of credit has to go to our host for uh, arranging this program so as to be as, it couldn't have been more topical, I think. 
Um, it is true what you are referring to, it's true what you're mentioning. However, I have to again be slightly more uh, concerned and critical um, in the sense that obviously the situation, the migration, the, the movement of population uh, in uh, countries outside Europe uh, is um, phenomenal. It will continue to be so. This has to do obviously with the fact that uh, in the periphery of Europe there have been um, incidents like the Arab awakening, etc., uh, that to a certain extent have gone astray. Um, uh, because they have, as we have already mentioned elsewhere, they have uprooted all the basic structures, okay. state structures, without having replaced them with anything, in many instances, like in Syria or in Libya. Uh, but this should be uh, sort of an alarm for, for the European countries, mm -hmm. because, as I mentioned earlier, um, it may be that the flows now have been sta are slightly more stable in, in Greece, but the indications are right. that, for instance, the flows are increasing in Italy. Right. So we should be vigilant. We should not be complacent. It might, we should make use of the time that we are offered at the moment in order to prepare better right. and to have a more humanitarian response to the situation. Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Andreas. Um, so, Ulla, you, had, you said earlier that you had some other uh, points you wanted to make. You talked about good and bad examples. Please. Yes, uh, maybe I would explain our health information system um, and some cases uh, related to that. As I mentioned, it's uh, fully digital. It comprises of four parts. First is a digital patient's record. It means that all your treatments, prescriptions, results of the tests are there. Second, digital prescription. It means that, uh, for example, if you have high blood pressure, you just call your general practitioner, he or she prescribes the drug, and you can go to the apotheca. You identify yourself there, and you get the drug. So it's very convenient, and almost everyone uses it, especially it's very convenient for parents of uh, small children, as you can imagine. And also, if you want to buy drugs for your elderly parents, who are living countryside, for example, the same case. You identify yourself, you identify that you are the child of your elderly parents, and you can buy the drug. They are expensive, as you know, and you can bring them with you if you are going to visit. It's very convenient, and almost everyone uses it. A third part of our electronic health system is the database of X-rays. Again, very convenient. For example, if you live in capital city, Tallinn, you had broken a bone and there was uh, X-ray done, or there was a doubt that you have a heart or a lungs issue, the picture is there. And if something happens somewhere during the holidays, for example, uh, these doctors there uh, have immediately access to your personal record and to all your X-rays. And actually, there should be a, four, a fourth part in this system as well. It's the uh, uh, digital treatment queue. It means uh, that this queue should be transparent. For example, if you are waiting uh, for a surgery and public health insurance has always uh, less money than needed, for good medical aid. And so sometimes people are waiting in a queue for months and sometimes even years. For example, for eye surgery uh, for elderly people or even some other conditions. And now um, the people in the ministry and in the parliament thought that it would be uh, very good if this queue would be transparent that everyone can check whether um, he or she could have this treatment in some of Estonian hospitals. Estonia is a very small country. It's always possible, or almost always it's possible, to visit um, different hospitals uh, in Tallinn or in Tartu or outside 
So it would be very feasible. Mm. Uh, of course, uh, this part of this uh, system doesn't work because the uh, big hospitals are opposing it. It would be make everything very transparent uh, for policymakers, and that's not what they exactly want. <laughs> but so, it's a fully digital information system. Uh, it's loved by the people and also by the doctors, although they say that it takes a huge time to insert all the data. You visit your general practitioner or some other doctor, and instead of talking to you personally, concentrate on your problem, your concerns, he or she must fulfill this electronic system. It's something what could be improved, and I'm quite sure that it will be improved. But in general, everyone is satisfied. And all the doctors are obliged, legally obliged, to insert everything. All tests, all pres prescriptions, all treatments. All immunizations, for example. Or allergic reactions against some drugs. Um, the first purpose of this obligatory aggregation of uh, such sensitive data as health data are is to create better possibilities for treatment, of course. And in depersonalized form, this data could be used for wise decisions for protection of public health, also for research, you can imagine. It's a valuable source for researchers and also for policymakers. But now, uh, what's the ombudsman role? To protect the people, the patients. And there was one case I wanted to explain here. It's really a valuable source for good purposes and for bad purposes. And last year, I had to interfere because I discovered that private injurers wanted to have access to this national electronic health system. Public injurers. And of course, private banks connected to them. Very convenient. There was a bill, a draft bill, draft law uh, in the parliament and they tried to have a small change, small change, a small access, a little bit, nothing important, rather technical. Immediately after we discovered it, we interfered, as uh, the Chancellor of Justice has the right to go to the Parliament and to interfere, uh, so we did. We explained the situation that it's really dangerous even unconstitutional. And of course, the members of parliament immediately agreed with us and no change of that nature was accepted. But it was really a dangerous situation and I'm absolutely happy that we managed to interfere and to avoid such kind of change in the law. Uh, because after that, the public trust had been weakened or even destroyed. You can imagine um, only one case is enough. For example, if there is a middle-aged person who had a cancer treatment. Now the cancer treatment nowadays is completely healthy, but wants to have a loan and insurance for a new apartment to go forward with the life. And now, the private bank or private insurer without giving any details or explanations because it's a private sphere says no refuses the loan and if we would discover that's the result of misusing the electronic health system and knowing the things what they shouldn't know that someone had five or ten years ago a cancer treatment has caused it. I'm quite sure that in all of our countries it would be the end right. of this very good digital 
administration. Mm. So a cautionary tale for sure. Thank you very much. We need to finish uh, just before one, so I will ask the panelists now to be slightly more uh, concise. But Laura and I do want to turn to you, Emily, at the end for some uh, remarks as well. So uh, Laura, um, you gave us a picture uh, of what you are doing, the Ombudsman is doing in Croatia. What advice would you give to others, uh, your colleagues here, who also face you know, problems of budgetary cuts, budgetary uh, reduced resources. What advice would you give in terms of acting uh, uh, in these circumstances? Well, I have to say, first of all, that my, the, the budget of my office actually increased ah. since I uh, took over the position in the last four years for approximately 10 to 15 percent. But at the same time, our case work, caseload increased by 88 percent. So those 10 to 15 percent yeah. of the increase in budget is actually not sufficient by, by all means. And of course, the, the threat doesn't always come only from the budget cuts. It comes from, as I said, the, the increase in casework, but also uh, adding additional mandates to the office that then efficiently prevent us to doing any of them in a way that, that should have been done. My office, apart from being ombudsman, is also NHRI, National Human Rights Institution, Equality Body, and National Preventive Mechanism. So there are many mandates that actually need to be um, sufficiently funded. Um, I'm sure there are many examples from the colleagues uh, of different kinds of pressure they're under, not only financial, but also otherwise. Um, some of the uh, good practices that we've been able to uh, use some of the tools, of course, submissions to governments and parliaments. I think you, you need to find a leverage point. That position in the government or the parliament, as is the specific case in, in each of the countries, which is the most influential and can actually uh, contribute. So in Croatia, there's no point in negotiating with the parliament because the decision actually is not being made in the parliament. Mm -hmm. It's made in either Ministry of Finance or the Prime Minister's office. So if I want to have increased, those are the two places I need to go to. Otherwise, it's the waste of, waste of time. Um, I know many of Ombudsman offices are also NHRIs, but some are not. Um, even if you're not, use the Paris principles, because Ombudsman offices should be independent. Of course, it's one of the main prerequisites that we have to have as the NHRIs, and then Paris principles can be used to also to negotiate, to, to advocate for providing sufficient budget because they ask for the uh, sufficient resources for the independent institutions. Um, also reporting to treaty bodies can be useful because then they make that remark in the final uh, recommendations, in the, in the final conclusions on strengthening of the independent monitoring uh, bodies. So I think that's also uh, a useful tool, but I'm sure there are many other examples from, from the colleagues. Um, maybe just quickly to answer to the question on uh, working with the members of parliament and not going into the political and electoral system in Croatia. Um, what we are trying to do actually is, to the extent that the budget allows, of course, um, to discuss those issues with local governments and local members of parliament uh, because they can really make the difference on the ground and we use the best practices to upscale, to discuss then that in the parliament we also can take part in legislative process. Um, I'm in the parliament every week when it comes to different legislations, roundtables, many, many initiatives. So we do work with MPs very often, but when it comes to specific decisions at local level that actually citizens then have some use of or can, can feel in their everyday life, it's the local level that, that's most useful. Right. Thank you very much, Laura. So, Paul, um, we've talked about this uh, during the entire conference, actually, the role of ombudsman in helping to achieve more open governance in uh, national administrations. But let's get your point of view on this. Thanks. Um, I think the big point to start with it is, ever since OGP was created, very often I introduce it as, you know, there are 
two trends going on at the same time, one towards more open and one towards more closed. Um, and, and the core idea of, of OGP is to tip the balance in favor of more open. Um, and, you know, we've made tremendous progress the last five years, but so has the other side, to <laughs> say so. Um, which means that if we want to tip the balance in favor of more openness, which means transparency, accountability, participation, government responsiveness, all these things we've talked about, um, we need to step up. And we need to step up in, in a couple of ways. Um, one is that um, the commitments we see countries make are very often focused on transparency, so the, the one value of open government. But, you know, countries struggle to do more on, on participation, accountability, and government responsiveness. That's one. The second is it still very often is a small conversation or an elite conversation. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's a couple of reformers on the government side that want this, and they get through OGP the space because of the high-level political backing the process has. There's some professional civil society organizations that have a specific agenda on this, whether it's around open contracting or beneficial ownership, um, participatory budgeting, and they help set the agenda. But it's not so much yet, not so much yet a national dialogue. So there's three things I think ombudsmen can do. And it builds a bit on, on what the OECD was saying in the morning. One is ombudsmen are an extremely strong and credible actor in this debate. We've seen in countries where the ombudsmen are part of the conversation, and especially in Latin America it happens very often, that because of the mandate ombudsmen have, they and the expertise by seeing what works and doesn't work in administrations, they're a very strong voice to articulate what reforms are most important to make. Mm -hmm. And in that sense, they're often a stronger voice than civil society. So that's the first one. I think if this is about the debate of collectively setting priorities for modernizing public administration and taking measures that address some of these bigger concerns we have, then being part of the conversation is number one. Number two is, um, is helping with the implementation and the monitoring of some of the reforms that are made by countries. Um, obviously, the monitoring, the accountability, uh, the complaint handling is core to the mandate of, of ombudsman. But we haven't seen, from our perspective, enough oversight institutes take a role in on if governments are actually delivering on it yeah. enough. So that oversight role can be stronger for ombudsmen and for other oversight institutions. That's the second one. The third one is, um, is inspire, is showcase, is spotlight, which goes back to the point Emily was making, but also to the point I think that the OECD was making that it's not just about pointing out what administrations do well and, and don't do well, and I very often think that praise probably works better than, than sticks, um, but it's also about showcasing by the work of your own organization, your own institutions, that you live up to the values of open government. If you combine these three things, then I think you have a good start. But the crux, is, and I'll close with that, is we had some, with Sanjay, some high-level meeting at the European institutions this morning and, and yesterday afternoon, and one of the things we heard, and it struck me, was, listen, we're making this enormous effort to open up our processes to be transparent because citizens can come in in every phase of our decision making nowadays but they don't they really don't and they don't really care and that's probably true um, because i've seen how the eu tries to bring in citizens and you know there's there's a way to win there um, technically on how to do it but also if you want citizens to be active and back at the heart of government you have to appeal to them you have to seduce them and you don't seduce them with lengthy documents that you, through a Google form, ask comments on, you seduce them by making participation about things they care about, about health, about education, about roads, about air pollution. And if you give them ways to prioritize and to act on these things they care about, then you can talk about active citizenship. And you need to do that in the whole cycle, when you think about what you're going to do, when you're doing it, and afterwards. So, if you just create 
opportunities for citizens to come in at the moment when they have a complaint, then you've lost the game. It's for the governments, and, and I see a role for oversight institutions and ombudsmen in that as well, it is the whole cycle that we have to look at. Mm. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, fascinating conversation. Emily, would you like to give us some of your uh, comments? I, I was fascinated by um, the digital um, administration uh, piece, but I have to say when, when you were talking about um, when you were applying for your passport or your uh, SIM card, I, I, uh, the image of my late mother uh, came to my mind. And um, uh, she, she, I think she had a, a mobile phone with just a few numbers in it. She certainly didn't have a smartphone. And the idea of saying to mom at the age of 87 that she should take a selfie and upload it <laughs> and put her digital signature on, on that, but you know. Uh, so I, I think we always have to be make sure of, of, of people uh, who, who can't uh, access that. But, though I can see, and certainly the way that you outlined the uh, incredible improvements that can be made in, in healthcare, particularly in preventative medicine, I mean, shows, sh shows the power of that. In relation to uh, the German colleague and, and talking about, after Laura's um, uh, talking about the interventions, the very direct interventions they make, Yes, I agree, and politicians, particularly at a local level, do in incredible work and are very much engaged and certainly feel um, you know, what, what citizens or refugees and others are, are going through and do actively contribute. But it is at the higher political decision-making level that I think obviously the problem lies, and certainly in relation to the asylum and refugee uh, issue. And in a sense, uh, ombudsmen, and, and particularly the, the, the two that are on the panel here, and particularly our Greek colleague, are left really to clean up the mess that have been made at a high political decision-making level. And the irony of that a country that has struggled as much as, as, Greek, as Greece ha has, as you have outlined, and as all, we are all very well aware, uh, that struggles with an enormous debt crisis, uh, that struggles to maintain basic public services, that it has been asked against those odds to deal with really so much of the uh, refugee and asylum um, uh, problem, that, 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 that the, the culpability for that has to lie with the politicians in whose hands it is uh, to deal with that. We've already spoken about the failure to, to share. Uh, there are many, my own country has taken very few uh, refugees. Some countries have taken none. Hmm. Um, and, and that is something that um, ombudsman really can't deal with because that is political decision making at the at member state level and also at the level of the Council uh, in the EU. But I think what ombudsmen can do by that very direct work that they do is both on a high level, continue to speak truth to power, that line we, we often say, but also to pass along the political chain, the experience of the people, how people experience the political decisions um, that are made. And then after that, it is in uh, it is in the political realm, which we, of course, have to stay out of. But at least we have the responsibility to show just what it feels like. Thank you very much. So that's been, as I said, a very, very fascinating journey into the different facets of uh, what the ombudsman are doing in, in different contexts. Um, so now we've, we've come to the end of this session and we reconvene at uh, 2.30 for the wor workshops. And these wonderful people uh, will chair the different workshops. Um, so you will be replaced by your colleague, Paul uh, Tonu Basu. Um, so just to say that this room has the interpretation. So uh, this is the only place there will be interpretation. And so this is going to be the open government, government workshop will be held here. So this is something that you should uh, keep in mind. Um, the other working shops, uh, workshops, let me just try and remember where you are. So Andreas, you are in the reception area. Your workshop at 2.30 is in the reception area. Ulla's digital workshop is in the small room. I think it's called the Petit Salon. Uh, so you will go there. And uh, Laura, yours is in a place called the Salle de Jeu, which is uh, amazing as well. And if any of you get lost, uh, there will be all Emily's team will be there to guide you uh, there. So, um, just a final thing. Um,
so there will be a summary. Uh, there will be detailed notes taken of uh, your workshops, and there will be a summary that will be sent to all the ENO members in the coming weeks. And at 5 o'clock, uh, the, the chair, the, the leaders of the workshops, will come back to report to the plenary where I will be once again. So thank you indeed all very much. Lunch is now served, and as I said, we reconvene at 2.30, and please join me in thanking our panelists.